Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody around the world. Great to have you joining us. Um, and a good sign of early momentum building here with our second workshop webinar Wednesday. We have more than 100 already joining live with us. So very excited to have you with us. I'm Matt Prohaska with Prohaska Consulting, CEO and Principal uh, and proud uh, co-leader of the second webinar Wednesday. This focused on CDP University, Customer Data Platform University, taking our great full day live event that we did, gosh, just about 10 weeks ago in New York City, eight hours, great session, packed room, and converting that and condensing it into a one hour session together globally. Um, so great to have all of you with us. Uh, here's our agenda for the day before, uh, for the morning or afternoon before tossing to our special guest and lead instructor. Uh, we'll cover a couple minutes of intros. Uh, we're gonna then dive in and do a full 30 minutes uh, building foundation blocks for what a CDP is and how it's used today. Maybe get rid of some of the myths and get into the real practice and uh, move from hype to reality around CDPs today. We'll then cover the five stages of implementing CDPs that brands and publishers, along with brands agency partners, can help implement in working with one or several of these great CDP tech partners. We'll then talk about a case study that we're proud to share and uh, very proud to be allowed to discuss uh, with our publisher client, Vivo, uh, in a multi-year partnership that we've had customizing a CDP for them. And then we'll open it up to the floor and we do uh, intend to have a full 10 minutes available for everyone uh, utilizing the chat and uh, camera and audio together. A couple other housekeeping notes here, uh, as we did last week and will going forward, um, please use the chat or hand raising icon, uh, either in private for us here. Uh, we see the chat uh, window with all of us. Uh, good to see Paul and uh, Paul Florangis and a lot of other great folks saying hi in the chat room already. Um, or again, use the, uh, the hand raising when uh, it's time for open Q&A. We'll certainly review those uh, as we go. Um, for the first time this week, we're gonna test uh, doing some polls and a little interaction, leveraging the capabilities of Zoom here, our, uh, our partner in video conferencing, along with uh, our teammates, uh, with Christine Bolden and Renee Kajowski, um, and Paul Semino, our guest speaker that I'll introduce in a second, will be tossing to you guys for a little bit of a quick survey and, and audience interaction to see how, uh, how CDPs are working for you and frankly, how well uh, the presentations are going. Um, everyone's gonna be auto muted, so uh, all due respect, uh, we're gonna remove any risk of background noise or distractions for anybody else so we can get through the content together. Um, Renee Kajowski then is gonna uh, do her great hostess duties and unmute as we go. So thank you again, Renee, for helping put this together and driving it. And then uh, again, we appreciate all of those of you who, uh, where English is maybe not your first language, allowing me and Paul and us to conduct this in English. Um, we do have the great Antonio Menuda, who leads our LATAM practice, uh, available for translations live and after. Um, for those in Spanish, or we're gonna be working on uh, potentially doing this uh, in language for the APAC region and elsewhere as well. Um, so. Without further ado, just to give a little more context for those of you uh, who may not be as familiar with our organization, uh, we're proud to be the largest and award-winning uh, consulting practice that help companies uh, a lot with their programmatic or data-driven practices. All of our services uh, fall under helping with one of three uh, areas, either with your tech, your targets, or your talent. These are the, some of the proud, sexy logos we're privileged to have helped out in the past and or today. And as a worldwide company, these are the places where we've had clients and or have teammates today around the world. Uh, more than 500 teammates available uh, and more than 80 working on something right now um, for different clients um, in at least right now, I'm pretty sure six, yeah, six different countries. Um, so thrilled to be serving uh, the whole ecosystem globally. So without further ado, I wanna introduce Paul Semino. Uh, those of you who were with us last week got a speed date version of uh, CDP University from Paul uh, rushing through and, and squeezing as much content as we could into a teaser session last week when we had our kickoff around how to work uh, smarter from home overall. And then certainly uh, wanted to uh, highlight some of the courses to come. This is our first one. Uh, and CDP University overall is something that Paul and I have been talking about launching for more than three years now. Thrilled again to have him as lead instructor with us. 
uh, in January and again here today. And Paul leads global strategy, uh, global data strategy for us across all of our client verticals for the past five years, helping brands, agencies, publishers, and then the tech companies themselves, um, along with, frankly, some good trade group work uh, that we've done uh, with different trade groups and publications and industry organizations, along with even helping some investor clients. So Paul is someone who certainly cuts across all of our different uh, client verticals, providing great uh, service uh, and insights and practical knowledge and application, uh, not just with CDPs, but overall data strategy. So I'm, I'm literally turning things over by approving Paul to control the screen from here. Uh, and Paul, take it away. Just need to unmute, Paul. Yeah. There you go. That darn mute button. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so happy to be with you you this morning uh, to talk about CDPs and uh, in this sort of university format. We want this to become uh, very interactive. The last 10 minutes, as Matt said, are going to be Q&A. Um, sorry. I think you want to back up. Oh, we were okay. trying to sneak in our first poll, actually, right, Paul, before that? Yeah, there's a little delay in the... There you go. Yeah, so first of all, uh, just a, a quick poll we're gonna take on, do you know what the, the acronym CDP means? And we'd like everybody to, or as many of you as wanna vote, please vote. We'll give you like 30 seconds. This Help is us gonna gauge. be intentionally easy since we gave away the answer on the previous slide. This is the, uh, hopefully, Folks are paying attention a little bit to both audio and visual here, but understandable that it may take some time for folks to understand not just what the acronym means, but obviously what it means for your business. Because again, there is uh, no shortage of uh, opinion and, uh, and uh, education, or at least positioning from a lot of tech companies around what CDPs are and aren't. Looks like a pretty good response already there, Paul. Awesome. So let's, uh, let's see what the votes total up. So we got 86% to 14. Um, so we can now, right, so platforms. Paul, you get there? I, I yeah, I'm having trouble with the the screen control. It's just sort of lagging. All right. So, so everybody remembers taking the SATs, and and we have a lot of acronyms in our industry. Um, and and the the simplest way to understand CDPs is CDPs are to DMPs as marketing is to advertising, and that is to say that. Marketing is the overall thing that we do. Um, you know, branding, finding, converting, making more loyal, our customer base, whatever they are. Um, and so CDP is sort of an umbrella that fits around things like DMPs, DSPs, um, and the other elements in our advertising and marketing stacks. So, and, and that will be a continuing theme that you'll hear for the next 30 minutes. I'm going to give you back control, Matt, because it's uh, it's a really there's a there's like a 10 second lag. Understood. Sounds good. Happy to drive. Thank you. So, if marketing is the umbrella and the different elements of or, or strategies that you can employ uh, are paid, earned, and owned, what CDPs become is the the catch basin for data. Um, the mining of data and the application of that data to the paid and earned and owned channels. We can, and the more sort of official definition is a centralized unified data platform that stores, organizes, and provides users easy access 
to a wide array of customer data. Um, the, the, the unique perspective that Prohaska has on CDPs is the, conjun the, the junction of advertising, marketing, and commerce. And you know, everybody is chasing Amazon in the, in the e-commerce e space, and now Amazon has, of course, gone into advertising. And uh, with Prime, it has one of the best loyalty marketing systems in the world. So it's, it's, it's not to say that you have to be like Amazon, but they're, they have laid the groundwork for best practices in CDP or an enterprise marketing, a holistic marketing approach, probably better than any other company. Um, in the past, you, when you look at sort of the 2000s and, and um, prior to that, Walmart, the Gap, and the big retailers that grew up in the, in the 90s and 2000s, they paved the way for the use of data in, in commerce in logistics, in supply chain automation, um, having products there when it was the right time. Uh, and um, as we moved into the 2010s and programmatic grew up, um, you had the advent of DMPs. And DMPs were the, uh, the, the cookie version of the list business that was used to d direct market. So, the, the heritage of direct marketing carried on to a channel-based, in the 2010s, a channel-based digital um, deployment and use of data through DMPs. Most of that DMP cookie data was shot into DSPs, and that gave, uh, you know, gave birth to behavioral targeting and all these things that we're doing now. And as we move into the 2020s, it's going to become more holistic. There's going to be unified data um, with privacy and um, optimization across marketing channels. Um, and, and the, you know, the, there are many complexities, the, not the least of which is the, is the global pandemic that we're dealing with and the fallout of advertising and people cutting budgets. Um, prior to that, we were already dealing with a lot of um, issues in the market relative to um, laws being passed uh, in Europe and California and across the country with uh, privacy. Um, the walled gardens that have formed up around the biggest pools of user data, um, sort of super CDPs, which are Google, Amazon, and Facebook. Um, the, the, the browsers getting stingier and stingier, you know, in, in, in favor of user privacy. Um, stingier and stingier around letting third parties write cookies to browsers so that we could identify use across a network um, and, and all the regulatory things that have been happening. So there's, there's a lot of headwind, but um, in, you know, in, in, in times of, you know, of, of challenge, there are also opportunities. And, uh, at Prohaska, and, and even prior to that, we've been talking about this for a long time. Um, this is something when I was running my DMP data exchange, really, we saw very early on was as user data, as user behavior transitioned from desktop to mobile, we saw erosion of cookie data because you can't, you couldn't cookie phones in the same volume as you could desktops. Um, and that's continued, it's been accelerated by the regulatory issues, by the browser issues, and you know, as you can see, we wrote, I predicted or whatever, the, the, the death of third-party cookies in 2013. I was a little off uh, by a, a year or so, but it seems like um, it's spot on. And, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about identity in a second. If you take away one thing from this talk today is that the ultimate business case of CDPs is to join your offline, your CRM, your database marketing system, your call center, whatever is your known customer method, uh, your method of con uh, communicating with known customers to join that with the digital world. And I'll, and, and what that really means is, you know, the, the, the heritage of offline, which uh, segmentation and direct marketing, um, telemarketing, uh, direct response television, uh, you know, television-based commerce with QVC and whatnot, 
the, the richness of data, the use of data in commerce and advertising and marketing has been going on for 40 years. Um, and I think a little bit like I was, I was in the e-commerce business and retail before this. And as I watched a lot of that, a lot of those learnings were not really used in digital. And, and we, we, in digital, we, we became a little bit, we spammy. Um, we didn't use data um, as much as we could have because there was so much media and it was, um, it was the, the quickest path to revenue and to profit. Now what we're seeing is, is, is uh, more than ever, especially with what's going on now, is that the unification of the two massive data sets, the smaller offline set and the larger online set is happening. So this is the use case of use cases for CDPs. Uh, because offline, you have fantastic segmentation. It's, it's focused on the most accurate data. But media is the media cost is much more expensive. And it takes a month or two or more to optimize and re-up your buy. If you did a direct mailing, like we used to do the, in the ancient times, you'd, you'd send out lists, you'd get the results back, you redo your model, and then you do it again. But that's taking months and months. In the programmatic world, that can happen in literally in milliseconds, and you can be constantly updating your models. So well, let's ask a second poll question. In terms of integrating online and offline marketing, and let's just talk about email and you know any, any type of offline marketing and, and online marketing, programmatic or whatnot, have you integrated online and offline marketing in your company? And we'll take like 30 seconds here to, to fill that in. And we know there might be a, people wanting to put in a third answer that says not completely, but we've started or we're doing it in part, but you know, basically any integration is a win at this point, um, showing the, the momentum of the data and more importantly, the teams uh, and the process starting to get more integrated. So <laughs> funny, we said it would be maybe about 50-50. Take a look at this, Paul. Wow, that's, that's promising. It's, it's probably what I would guess. Um, and, I, and I think if we asked of the 50% that have started, where are they on a scale of one to five, I think it would be more towards the beginning. Um, uh, and I think as, as consultant advisors, this is what amazes us that as much as we are at the bleeding edge of things, as an industry, we're still, you're, you're still not behind and you shouldn't feel like you're behind uh, because it is, you know, whatever baseball analogy you want to use, it's the, um, it's really like the bottom of the first or the top of the second inning when it comes to fully integrated um, online and offline marketing. So let's, let's just zoom in on the, the part of the funnel and the tactics that we're using to integrate online and offline. So again, the loyalty data, the customer data, your best data, your, the, the, the attributes of your product or service that, that make people love your product or service is in the CRM part of the funnel. Um, let's just call this the small data for a second. Even though it can be tens of millions of records, um, it's not as big as the stuff at the top of the funnel, the anonymous data sets that are coming out of advertising as ad servers, DSPs, log files, web servers, um, CDN records, uh, these are, um, these can be in the billions of records per day um, when it comes to uh, uh, the, the, the sort of volume. They're very sparse when it comes to your information, the, the information that's rele relevant to your company. And the game becomes how can a CDP, meaning a massive data set, data lake, and the applications on top of it that can find that valuable data. How, how can they find the things in the top of the funnel that are relevant to the most uh, valuable attri attributes in the, the, the bottom of the funnel? If you can imagine inverting your marketing funnel so that the best attributes from your best customers are being mined, applied, mimicked, and cloned and being applied to your branding ads, you would, you would have sort of a perpetual cycle of optimization between your known customer data universe and your anonymous data universe. In other words, marketing would be constantly informing advertising and advertising would be constantly informing marketing.
So a couple of minutes about identity and uh, the left side is the CRM data world. The right side is the anonymous data world. And what we've seen is the intersection of these is becoming thinner and thinner. Um, there are amazing companies and technologies that have been built in the middle, in the middle of this live RAM, um, data logics, Oracle, uh, uh, new star are the three main linkers of offline data, which gets hashed or, um, uh, to link to an online record, which is usually a cookie. Um, the bigger data set in the middle is geodata. And that, because anything can be linked to geography, um, whether it's a, a hyper geo around a household using something like a zip code plus four, meaning a cluster of houses, or on the right side, um, you get more into uh, IP addresses and whatnot. And I think we have another slide that sort of gets into that. So when you talk about a, an identity graph, which is a number, of, a number of data elements that can link to a number of data elements on another side, these are all of the identity methodologies that you have to put into your identity graph. So on the left is all the known identity uh, CRM data points. On the right is the um, anonymous data elements. And in the middle is sort of the, the elements you can use to link them. Um, and yes, that does say census blocks because they're, it's still a type of data that links um, from a geo standpoint. Discrete marketing area is the area around a city which contains all zip codes. IP address is the set top box ID or the router ID. Um, customer ID is your customer's ID. So identity graph, very important. And if you look at this as a layer cake, if you imagine this vertically, the biggest data set that you have on the bottom is the first party data that you own that you might not think you own. The log file from your DSP that you license, you pay money to, is your data. It's just that most companies don't have the unstructured data lake capability to capture that data every day and, and synthesize it into the data that's meaningful to them. Um, we advise that you do this. Um, the technology is usually called Hadoop or Spark or one of these other um, open source uh, distributed data technologies. On top of that, you have your first party CRM data, which contains segmentation and identity graph on top of that. And then on top of that is the intelligent data that's been mined um, by a uh, machine learning system or whatnot. And that's sort of the perpetual system. You've got your big data at the bottom and it's getting smarter and smarter and smarter until you're able to make uh, better data decisions. And we see this as sort of a continuum of the linkage of your different marketing and advertising systems. The first step is have you linked email to your website? Most companies have done this. When you sign up, when you register, you instantly get an email. Next is retargeting, website to programmatic remarketing, you know, sort of chasing people around if they've put something in a shopping cart or hit a number of pages on your website. Then we come to multi-screen uh, programmatic, which is I think where most people are right now. Um, that's just remarketing the same as the previous tactic, but across all screens with some kind of frequency capping capability. On top of that, which is where very few companies have gotten, is the integration of social media, which is, is pretty much a black box, but it is capable of using the identity methods we have to sense what's going into social media and these giant platforms and what results are coming out. Even harder than that is to synthesize and include search data. And then at the top is sort of, you know, the this would be the inclusion of all marketing and advertising methods, including um, uh, traditional television, radio, out of home, and other geo-based systems. And I think we have another uh, poll question coming up. So if you think about those things on a scale of one to six uh, or five, I forget how many that there were, where does your company rank? Five, sorry. Thank you. And we'll give that a couple of seconds. Christina Rade, we have that uh, final poll question popping up.
I'm getting an error when I try to share the results. So, what does it look like though if you have the results? Forty-six yes, fifty-four no. All right, we we can we can get into that in the Q and A. We can you know parse parse out where people are and and whether I'm right in saying that most people are at that part of of the cross screen retargeting. That seems to be where the industry is right now. Oh, sorry, that was that was the last poll. Oh. So looking at the architecture of the CDP system, the, the basic elements are the optimization, management, and activation of data. And it comes in, in sort of three pieces. On the left is, let's call it the small data set, the CRM data set, the reference data set. Um, this is where you have uh, the, the data lake and the farming, the collation, the normalization and hygiene of data. And on the right is where you're activating and optimizing the data. In the middle, you have segmentation, and then you have the information coming back. And the central dashboard is a machine learning application. So these are the basic elements of, of any CDP system. It's, it's, if you're talking about, I'm trying to use my loyalty marketing system to inform my DSP, my programmatic media buys, this is what it would look like. If you're a publisher and you're trying to make your most valuable customer data applicable to bigger data sets or to magnify the effect of them, we used to call it lookalike modeling, um, which was very clunky and we usually had lookalike uh, when it was you know, 30 days too late. Um, this is more of a real time system and um, sort of the architecture of the, the, the bottom line CDP. So if we just look at a business case, this, this is not a use case, this is just an automotive um, company and their agency. They took 5,000, um, uh, sorry, they took a 5 million piece mailing offer in which normally they would get a like a one and a half ROI on and they'd sell 900 cars. That's what's on the left. On the right, you have, we, we, we took our, our unique identity graph that we talked about before using every method possible. We matched that to every digital element we could and we opened up um, 30 million impressions over two months. And it only cost, if you look at the budget of the direct mailing, yeah, 5 million people, lot. it's $3 million. It's $3 million. The, the magnification of that to get to all these impressions only would cost $100,000. And with you know, sort of the normal assumptions of click-through rate and conversion rate, you'd sell an additional 90 cars um, and generate almost a half a million dollars in additional revenue for that $100,000 spend, a much higher ROI. Um, and if you just think about this being part of your normal practice of um, you know, when you have a central method, you think about how to use either one channel, two channels, or three channels to get the job done, you're gonna make more money. Um, and, and the schematic of that, if, if, if you're working in, you know, if this was an e-commerce retailer, they'd be using mail, email, web display, they would have numerous agencies working on that um, somewhat redundantly, you know, your CRM agency, the, the email service provider that might be controlled by them or your internal department, the digital agency, and then probably another agency like out of home or some experimental agency. Um, it, it becomes, you, you can just see the inefficiency. And then when you install a CDP, you have, and this is way oversimplified because it's not like drop, send, send an SMS, view, 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 send, click, take. It's not like that dance. It's much more complicated than this. But this is for uh, you know, visual purposes only. If you have that data set and you have the data mining ap application on top of it, um, the secret formula is, is, is really, that's what it is. If you figure out how people experience your brand from top to bottom, it will become your algorithm, your machine learning method for whatever part of your funnel is most broken. And for most people, it's that they do a great job advertising and they do a great job of converting prospects, but advertising the prospect is, is where things are broken down. This becomes the method that can 
um, become proprietary and become an asset to the company. And, and when you think about data, it's, it's really multidimensional. It's not just first party, second party, third party data. The very principles of the offer of the product can go into the data. Um, and we're not gonna cover it in this CDP University um, webinar, but in, in subsequent um, webinars, we're gonna talk about how can um, ERP systems, inventory, what's on sale, that these, these parts of the, of the, the enterprise that are not part of marketing and advertising right now are going to become part of advertising. Um, and we'll do that later. So if you think about that, um, the diagram of, of the many methods the e-commerce retailer was using to communicate with that prospect, it, it is even really more than that because there are so many touch points around the customer. Um, and if you think about the CDP as a sort of a brain, if you will, a central analytical method for either frequency capping, um, targeting, suppression, whatever the use case is, um, this is where we're trying to get to. And, and this is an eye chart and it, it's again, leaning towards what we're gonna you know, talk about in subsequent you know, cases, but you'll see all of the elements that are in a, an ad stack today and a data stack today. It's just that your the input and um, the output is going you know, into the central brain. Um, and the other thing to focus on is this is the new, the, the analytics and machine learning stack is sort of the new part of your CDP um, or, or enterprise marketing stack that's going to be coming into view. I know that people have machine learning in a channel but having machine learning across channels is, is a new uh, capability. And that, the, uh, that's the background stuff. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, tremendous. Um, in 30 minutes, a crash course. Um, for those of you who are not in the trenches uh, within your own organization or are in between organizations um, working uh, with hands dirty in CDPs. Um, hopefully that proved to be a great primer for you. And again, uh, let me take just a few minutes now um, following up on that and talk about how organizations can get in rhythm uh, utilizing CDPs in their organization. Um, and just as we've done uh, proudly having pretty sure taught more people how to sell programmatically, buy programmatically, operate programmatically, um, than any other independent firm in the world. What we found in doing training, our second most popular service of all the things we do over the last six years in business, we've noticed uh, and found personally and just uh, with our clients that it's a lot easier teaching when you're showing folks how to do things in rhythm with their normal job. Um, as we always say, it's not like you need to go off to the side and do programmatic or do CDP um, and then for two hours and then come back and whoa, that was different. And then you're doing your normal job. We think, as you can hear from Paul, talking about real use cases, real opportunities, and, and real touch points within an organization, uh, that this is just something that everyone's going to have as part of their uh, arsenal and part of their skill set going forward. So in that same spirit, we've created the five stages of CDP utilization uh, for both brands and uh, really for publishers, not just because publishers are brands into in themselves, but also because when you think about, again, Paul's slide earlier, talking about the paid, earned, and owned uh, aspects of marketing and how publishers always think about paid advertising. But if you think about your audience uh, and uh, readers or viewers uh, and think about them as a lifetime value um, of an audience and what you're getting long term, the same way a car manufacturer thinks, the same way a toothpaste manufacturer thinks, you think about your audience development in terms of people coming back, obviously, over time and what they're doing to be in touch with your fantastic content, entertainment services, what have you, then hopefully, again, the, the utilization of a CDP, and we'll show you one of the use cases for our client Vivo right after this uh, and how that uh, uh, comes to fruition. But for brands and, and publishers alike, there are really five stages uh, that we'll go through very quickly here. Um, first, again, always get the strategy set and then go into tactics. So first, 
at the strategy level. And again, for those of you who have been throwing in the comments uh, just to us panelists or to all attendees um, that you do need to leave at the top of the hour a few minutes ago, we appreciate you staying and wonderful to have more than 100 people still with us live at this point. Uh, this is a little bit in, intentionally in the form of a checklist. Um, but, you know, again, as Renee, our hostess with the most has said earlier uh, in comments, we'll be sharing this uh, with everyone after. So uh, the point certainly here is not to be reading all of these, but you can see some of the highlights in terms of how to get your strategy set. Um, and this is something critical, certainly when brands are working with their agency partners, uh, when it comes to leveraging media and creative. As many of us know, uh, the last 20 plus years have been spent with a lot of brands splitting the vote and giving media to one agency or multiple agencies and creative to another agency or multiple agencies. The CDP can be that connective tissue or glue that brings everybody together and aligns on the same strategies here of what the, K, what the, what the KPIs are, key performance indicators that are critical and making sure everyone is, is on mission and on the same page together. Once you align your strategy, then you want to get to a design. And so here are a quick, here's a quick checklist of questions you want to make sure uh, that you cover. And again, you saw from the earlier visuals in Paul's description that there are obviously a number of different touch points, depending on the category you are as a brand or the number of ways you interact. Um, you know, thinking about our friends at Time Out, um, UK and New York and all around the world, who uh, given COVID have changed their name to Time In uh, temporarily and had to unfortunately shut some things down with their physical stores and event space. But they're a perfect organization post COVID that can leverage all of these uh, types of data streams, obviously retailers as traffic flows uh, more post COVID uh, when we get through this global pandemic together, understanding all the different data points in the physical world and in the virtual world, how it's collected, making sure that it's done appropriately tied to local uh, laws and global best practices and standards. And then what the governance is going to be uh, related to that around how you get consent, making sure this is opt-in and, and or at worst, uh, again, if opt-in is not part of uh, your region's laws already, uh, making sure there's very clear language and a very smooth, easy process for anyone to opt out appropriately once they understand uh, the trade-offs here and why this data is being collected just to create a more personalized and better experience when it comes to content and marketing. Once the design phase is completed, then you're gonna to wanna to start the actual blocking and tackling of collecting and integrating. And so here's a little quick two by two around thinking about the inputs and outputs and some things that are one click away from being able to uh, integrate. And then, you know, something that takes a little more uh, heavy lifting uh, when it comes to, you know, bigger services like an in-house CRM. Uh, you know, uh, many uh, top CRMs that have been in business for a long time. We're, uh, for example, a Salesforce shop, um, but there are many other great services like NetSuite and Vase and plenty others that have had great CRM and are now quickly recognizing um, either through, you know, Salesforce and Oracle and others acquisition, uh, Adobe and others uh, certainly that have brought pieces together uh, that check many of these boxes. Being able to have them obviously in one place on an enterprise level is key but knowing that in a lot of other cases, it makes sense, like a lot of the clients we've helped uh, in choosing different tech partners, that sometimes piecemeal needs to be done, um, especially with one D2C brand that uh, Nikki and her team are working on on the uh, brand strategy side right now. So once the collecting and integrating is done, certainly then getting to activate uh, is key. Uh, someone just asked in real time, Robert, GA stands for Google Analytics. So sorry, thanks for, uh, for asking for that in real time. Um, there's just one analytics uh, example, um, obviously other analytics packages available there. Um, so once you activate, um, and <laughs> nice Homer Simpson there from Robert, that was an easy question, no, uh, no worries there, it made sense to ask. Um, once you activate then, you know, you get your segments in place, you're able to orchestrate and make sure again that the messaging critical, you know, there are still so much, we are, we are a long way away from having the orchestra of media and creative operating uh, very well. You'll see in our schedule uh, at the end of the show here that programmatic creative is a future session we're going to be doing a deep dive on. Uh, it's a practice that certainly is, is critical. We've spent a lot of time uh, as an industry nailing the media side and getting right place, right time, right, uh, right person, or at least right cookie um, targeted. Oftentimes, there are still too many folks forgetting, oh, right, maybe the message needs to change. 
today in the world we're living in today. I'm, I'm sure we've all seen in a coronavirus world plenty of examples digitally and through analog uh, channels where the creative's been a little tone deaf or people just forgot to shut off or swap out obvious creative that doesn't really make sense in today's world uh, for the time being. Being able again to orchestrate that in real time and tie that into a CDP again. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about basic blocking and tackling of just turning off and on proper messaging, but to get more sophisticated and leverage a CDP for creative, there's a critical uh, glue there where it can really, really work very, very well and take advantage of the great storytellers uh, that you have either in-house at the brand or again with your agency partners. Um, and then again, once that orchestration is done, deploying it and making sure again that there are unified analytics packages in place so that everyone has their eyes on the same prize the KPIs are there in real time and everyone understands why optimization and changes need to be made. Speaking of optimizations, that's stage five, of course, always the final stage. As we know, this is a concentric circle or, you know, um, an infinity loop, whatever visual uh, that you want to use. We've, we've already shown you a couple of them. We'll show you another one coming up. Um, but the ability to optimize and get a machine going where, again, it's not just um, AI, but the human beings making those decisions and understanding why and then what to do about those results uh, is most critical. So it is, uh, as, as everyone knows, far from set it and forget it. So those are the five stages and we wanted to talk about how they're being applied a little bit uh, to a client that we're very proud to have been helping now for about two years and that's uh, the great global publishing client in the entertainment and music space, Vivo. Um, Paul, do you want to maybe uh, touch on this since again, uh, this has been done in partnership with a uh, with a, uh, with a CDP development shop and great uh, data mechanics, as we uh, call them, uh, a shop called Aquifer, uh, based in, in the US with, uh, with tentacles as well into Europe now as well. Um, and a group that we've worked with now for uh, more than a couple of years, on uh, not just this, but other uh, opportunities helping uh, basically take either uh, from scratch or take uh, existing CDPs uh, and tweak and customize uh, for best use with in this case, a publisher around their inventory and how uh, they can leverage uh, the, the, a CDP to improve their premium inventory and then bridge that into the rest of their earned and owned. Paul? Thanks, Matt. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and Aquifer, where I'm, I'm a co-founder, the, the company was founded on the principle of all companies. Actually, we were all operators. And this is you know when, when Matt and I met way back. We had all created redundant capabilities to, you know, to have at scale data to listen to, you know, our part of the web that was relevant, whether we were a publisher, an advertiser, or a service provider in the middle. And those those stacks, those data stacks were redundant and extremely costly. You know, spinning up a data lake, an enterprise marketing data lake, is not, you know, you know, these Hadoop based systems, these are all new open source projects. Um, very expensive. The engineers who operate them are very expensive. So the and, and the reason that Prohaska selected Aqua for this for this assignment was because um, of, of just that. It, it was a, a toolbox, a tool set, and and we haven't emphasized this enough. It's first party software, and all of the methods that we're talking about. We're not trying to say that you shouldn't have third parties helping you. It's just that these things, the identity graph, the machine learning. Um, methodology and the segmentation methodology should be first party, we think, yours. Um, just in the same way that you license Microsoft Office or Oracle Financials or some other SAP system, you should have that. So Vivo was in a case, uh, a, a situation that most publishers, most you know, large publishers are, are in, which is they have fantastic inventory from all the music videos and, and they have valuable advertising space between them, but it's limited. Um, and it's limited for two reasons. One is because it's sold through reference data. They don't have first party data, but the, the reference data that they use from Nielsen and Comscore are very similar to first party data. It's smaller. It can't be applied to all the log data that they're getting. Um, and so they would sell out of their premium inventory quickly and then have to cobble together and manually machine learn um, additional uh, inventory using an in-house analytics team. That process was very elaborate and very manual. So we provided two things for them. One was a, um, a business process automation uh, capability and a business system that allowed them to automate that, that manual process, saving them a lot of labor 
and and putting and enabling that team to put um, that energy into a new machine learning system that we built that has that that same principles that I talked about before, where the small data was being applied to the big data, and we were able to um, increase the team's productivity thirty percent, double their premium inventory, and um, you know and and really have a meaningful impact on profitability. Um, and, and, and this is a, mo this is a practical model, a, a real use, world use case from what I was saying before, which is whether you have CRM data that's walled off and, seek, and, and not really connected to or only connected by third parties to your, your digital data, um, you need to create a system that uh, through your own identity graph, using external vendors if need be, maps to that digital data and allows you to magnify the effect of whatever it is you're trying to do. For Vivo, it was to sell these really cool bundles of inventory that were like, you know, um, <laughs> metal moms, meaning moms with kids in the household that love metal. And because those, the, the attributes from that had certain, um, uh, you know, attractiveness for brands that were marketing some other product. Um, and increasing and doubling the size of that segment is very meaningful to them. It might be that you have a part of your system, your first party data system that's um, uh, first based, based on first party data and you're looking to magnify the, the effect of that, whether it's a publisher trying to increase the size of inventory using first party data, or it's an advertiser trying to echo success that they had in their first party data from their agency. Um, this is the type of system you need to employ. And ML stands for machine learning, sorry. And, and I know in our industry, we use machine learning and AI interchangeably. Um, and you'll, if you get a bunch of mathematicians in a room, they'll have an argument about it. But for, for us, machine learning is sort of the automation of optimization. It's not taking the human out of it. It's giving the human a dashboard and, and so that they don't have to toil with manual parts of machine learning, that that's all automated. AI is a whole other frontier for us. That's what Matt was referring to before with, uh, you know, um, creative optimization and journey mapping and all that stuff. Thanks, Matt. Great stuff. Thank you, Paul. And thanks to Amit Shah, who runs Global Publisher Operations for us. Um, uh, all Dan, uh, Dan Jay and the team at Aquifer, and obviously Natalie, uh, Kevin McGurn, and the, and the whole crew at Vivo, who's been uh, great, uh, certainly in, in taking uh, the promise of this and then the execution of this and putting it to good use uh, in their uh, in their ad sales and other uh, worlds right now. Um, so hopefully a little bit of practicality uh, that this is again more than just theory, uh, but a lot of good practice for folks. Um, so with that, I know we've already got one or two questions in the chat that folks have thrown in, uh, but wanted to open it up to Renee, our hostess with the Moses, who's running the uh, running the phone lines as uh, as we used to say in the uh, radio business and. Uh, and see if there are some open questions. I will take one uh, that we already got in uh, from Robert earlier today um, as, a, uh, as a first one, um, just as we get going with the uh, chat for folks raising their hand or utilizing the chat tool here. Uh, Robert asks, uh, uh, you mentioned linking to cookies with Microsoft's recent announcement about de-supporting cookies. Does that imply individuals would opt in and have to self-identify for linking? Um, I'll start with that one and then toss to Paul to fill in blanks. Um, yeah, there is a future session you'll see in our schedule where we'll be talking about identity in our upcoming uh, uh, workshop webinar Wednesday because uh, we feel the two largest challenges um, and important issues, again, uh, asterisk to coronavirus being number one for everybody, but the two most important issues in our industry overall on a macro level um, happen to be the two areas where there are three companies outside of mainland China that have about seven out of every $10 of digital spend. Um, and the reason is because they have the best deterministic identity globally, and they've used the best methods and sales tactics around attribution and measurement. And so yes, in a post cookie world that we assume is coming now, fortunately and finally, from a big picture standpoint, because we, I think, had an over dependency on that the last decade, um, but that's coming in, in well, let's just say realistically, the next 12 to 18 months. Um, yeah, it means that we think there's going to be a movement and a lot of momentum being built 
towards an opt-in process globally where the relationship between publishers and their audiences and brands and their customers changes dramatically. And obviously having a CDP empowers both groups to be able to engage more effectively. That and partnering with a consent management platform or CMP certainly will help as well so that people know how to raise their hand and offer whether it's an email address or a phone number or some other unique ID that is tied to me as Matt. I have two identities using email, one for work, Matt at ProhaskaConsulting.com and one for personal, Prohaska at gmail.com. Everyone else certainly has multiple identities that we use either professionally or and or personally. And so we think that if it's used appropriately with proper regulation, proper guidance, that's consumer first, privacy or privacy first, uh, shout out to our friends in London, um, then you know, we think there will be a new, uh, a new relationship and value exchange. The same way that social platforms and search engines and proprietary video aggregators um, ha and retailers have been able to generate with billions of customers and audience members for the last decade plus. Matt, I have yep. a couple other questions. Um, Mike Nicholson, I'm going to open up for you to ask your question because it's actually a pretty, uh, it's a very good one. And uh, there we go. Oh, if not, I will ask for him. Um, Mike asked um, who, I'm sorry, how many different functions within the organization are typically involved in the buying and integration of a CDP? Well, yeah, good question, Mike. Uh, shout out to you there in London. Um, well, this will give you an indication. Paul, you want to fill in the rest of the blanks and give an answer? Because we've seen anywhere from one to 20, right? Right. And, and Mike, if, if by CDO you mean chief data officer, you get 20 points. Towards I do. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that, becomes the, that becomes sort of the nexus um, uh, because it's sort of a hybrid or, or the without taking too much of the CMO's time and the CTO's time, the CDO becomes the center point of this. Um, if you don't have a CDO, um, we, we think that all of these functions, but that you do it in an agile method, that's why we showed the step ladder, so that if, if you're looking at the, the, the juiciest part of your marketing funnel that has inefficiencies, um, yeah, um, which we think, you know, um, Frequency across screens for your highest performing segments, ads, um, um, and, and advertising, I, I would aim at frequency capping um, across screens. Going multi-channel to understand frequency capping across all other media is another one, um, but, but those, are, those, um, those roles are all gonna be involved, but it's probably not them, it's their subordinates um, we've started to see the, the title of integrated marketing department head VP show up. It's really sort of a, you know, maybe a predecessor of the CDO. Um, but we're big fans of a chief data officer that's, you know, the, that, that left brain, right brain hybrid of um, understands marketing journey mapping and the principles of what runs marketing, but also understands all the technical aspects of data. Okay, I have another question from Tim Harvey. What would be an early quick win from putting or starting to put a CDP, CDP strategy in place? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that sounds like our entire approach with every client is just to get a, an early quick win to show that, uh, again, you can uh, see the ROI from the time and money invested uh, right away. I mean, Paul, this is a little bit of the, the map here. And, and frankly, if it's all right, I'm going to... Uh, jump to one of our other tease outs so we can spend another minute answering questions. But uh, once I get through this, sorry here. Um, yeah, this is a little bit of the early quick win, uh, depending on what stage of the data strategy journey you're on. Paul, you want to maybe give a couple examples of, of where, you know, we've, we've gotten early quick wins before just getting one campaign or one brand or one, you know, um, one division uh, aligned so that we can uh, see the before and after. Yeah, I think, you know, um, Vivo is a really good example of a publisher because, you know, publishers are going to be under even more pressure than before, as we said. Um, so increasing 
the the volume and 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 the fidelity of your top shelf segments using this methodology is probably the quickest win and 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 it's it's if you just rank the the way that you sell media from a segmentation standpoint from top to bottom start with the top um, on the advertiser on the buy side i think it's um suppression is something that cdps can be used for so if you cut your your sort of media, your your media buys and and the the impressions into you know um, quintiles, deciles, whatever, and you just look for the bottom third or quarter that is just waste. If you can find an analytical method and an application and a deployment method to suppress those ads, you're you're going to save a lot of money. Thank you. Paul, I have another question um, from Rick. Does a CDP only work for publishers at a certain traffic level? Um, what level uh, do you need to be at to uh, for a CDP to be in your range? That is a great question. Because um, what we haven't seen is uh, CDP Junior. All of these are enterprise class, you know, um, 10 million uniques a month. Uh, I, I'd say for, for, the, for the publishers in the mid-tail and, and the sort of lower mid-tail, you know, people that are a million impressions uniques a month, um, I have not seen a product yet. Um, it would probably depend, you know, this is where we're getting into the advisory stuff, but the, I would ask the question, is that a CRM rich publisher? Do they have a lot of, of subscriptions? Law, you know, do they have a lot of known IDs? And do they have a CRM business? Do they have an email business? Um, because if they don't, they have to learn to farm that data because there's going to be no way to build a CDP off of media that doesn't have, a, you know, a cousin in the CRM business, meaning, you know, a lot of first party data. And just to add to that, um, by the way, shout out Rick to uh, Montreal. Um, great to have uh, that great city represented here. Um, yeah, a lot of the uh, a lot of the reason for for Paul's answers is, is twofold. One is the size of the segments and how you can get closer to one to one, but start to do some of these you know stages in the middle. It also, of course, has to do with the size of the investment required for the tech. Um, you know, it's amazing how that every, you know we did we we used to do DSP or SSP uh, training. Uh, you know, still do, but you know, seven years ago, um, demand side platform and supply side platform. And a question is always, hey, um, how big does a brand have to be or how big does a publisher have to be in order to use an SSP? Well, part of it, you know, seven years ago was because the pricing on this uh, was far different than it is now. And not, there were not uh, at the time the, you know, either small to medium business or the more localized versions of this uh, scale to be able to fit uh, you know, publishers of a certain vertical or region of the world or a size in general. So, you know, those are the two things that, uh, you know, you can, you can almost plot on a, on a graph how much more easily uh, this, this uh, gets implemented and uh, the ROI can trigger quicker for medium to smaller publishers as, as time goes on. Some of it's just, you know, uh, good old Moore's Law and macroeconomics and good competition, realizing that hey, let's go get big publishers, but then gee whiz, a lot of other publishers could use this as well. So great question. I think we got time for one more, Renee, before we wrap. Um, I actually, I, I think I just uh, lost Henry uh, Lovehawks, who was uh, joining in and answering some questions. I think I'm here now. Oh, oh you are, thanks. I, I thought I lost you there. So um, are there any other open questions that we have? Or does Henry, do you have something to add from your experience? Uh, simply that, uh, haven't, uh, going back to Tim Harvey's uh, question, uh, haven't uh, we have, uh, been in uh, various types of uh, system and uh, online consulting services for a while, heard this before as also known as proof of concept or a, a pilot project. Once you get to uh, define one that has a goal, has an immediate need and go from there to... Uh, to see if we're on the right track before you commit large budget. Yeah, yeah. The good news is that this does not have to be a seven-figure investment right out of the box, um, seven-figure U.S. or pounds or whatever. Um, 
we know seven figures might translate to lower money depending on what country you're dialing in from. So um, yeah, it doesn't have to be a million USD um, to get started. There are ways again around DMP light uh, like we show here. Um, there are ways uh, again to you know take different services here, um, Henry and others um, that, that have a similar question and kind of chunk this out, project it out and get a quick win. This does not have to be, you need to turn over, you know, we know one bank that a year ago told us they had 87 people working on their CDP initiative. Um, I'm sure it's over a hundred now. Um, and so it doesn't have to be that much of an all in. Uh, very similar to how DMPs got started, very similar to how any tech gets started, you know, ad serving or what have you. Um, you know, take one part of your business, take one campaign, uh, and do the classic, you know, control and test and pilot the program. Um, and you can get a win and then, you know, spread the love across the halls, or in this case, across Zoom or your other favorite uh, video conferencing streaming service to uh, share the good news uh, across uh, all of your different offices and teammates. So I think we're good there. The rest of the questions, Renee is going to uh, do her usual great job and help us collect and and gather so that we can either answer individually with you after and maybe some 15 minute speed dating uh, sessions. We do have a, you know, kind of a free consulting offering that many of you probably saw over, over email last week. Um, not just in these times, but taking advantage of the technology and a lot of other people uh, getting used to being uh, remote. You know, we've been this way with more than 80% of our global team for six years anyway. So, you know, wherever we can answer uh, quickly and jump back on the line here, to help out, we'd love to obviously continue the conversation um, and continue helping. A little bit of a tease out as we wrap up here. Here is our weekly schedule. Um, you know, we've already now uh, covered our second week here. We're going to be diving into programmatic selling and then buying, looking at both sides of that house. And then um, with some announcements we have uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks and some other momentum being built around uh, the global identity uh, solutions and uh, revolution that are being made now. We'll dive more into identity. Um, you can see the rest of the schedule. You know, we've moved, uh, some of you may notice, we've moved out of home back a little bit. We know that media channel and the, the players in that ecosystem either focused exclusively there or working in out of home along with other media channels are suffering a great deal, obviously, just the nature of out of home or public advertising. So we wanna save that and, uh, and hopefully, you know, things will be uh, better to come back strong uh, there and talk about uh, the training we've done live uh, back in November. And we're going to be doing live in London last week with our partners at DPAA, but you know, we'll look to do that now uh, together uh, in about six weeks. We'll also see content marketing uh, with our expert Alan Schulman and the rest of our team on there, along with attribution and measurement, make the schedule as well. As you can see, it's a little dependent based on what you guys tell us you want to see and obviously where we can hopefully uh, find some appropriate underwriters that I know our team is working on to bring on partners to show again a little more of the practice and the tactical aspects in demoing some of these great solutions that can help with the various webinar topics. So that said, look at that, um, just five minutes over and we know uh, pretty amazing to have more than 70 uh, staying with us for more than five minutes uh, past the full hour. Wanna thank you on behalf of Paul Semino, Renee Kajowski, Christine Vold, and Nikki Hawk, Amit Shaw, the rest of the Prohaska Consulting team globally, not just for this week, but uh, staying in touch. Um, hope everyone continues to be healthy and safe and we'll see you here next Wednesday. Thanks, everybody. Be safe, y'all.